Well, hello there, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what is making the headlines with the chief leader writer at The Observer, Sonia Soda, and the chief executive of Conservative Home, Mark Wallace. Lovely to see both of you. So, as ever, let's take a look at the front pages. Uh, starting with the Financial Times, the Bank of England's latest intervention, buying gilts again to prevent fire sales by pension funds, the paper tells us. The Telegraph also has the latest on the country's economic turmoil. They lead with sterling falls as the bank pulls the plug on that pension help. The Eye tells us of Truss's latest move to silence rebels with a cap on energy profits, a move aimed at saving taxpayers billions. The Guardian also covers the energy crisis, the headline power giants to face a windfall tax after all, as Trust delivers a U-turn. The Express details the King's latest demands, a slimmed down coronation to more accurately reflect the country's cost of living crisis. The Metro leads with the chilling case of alleged baby killer Lucy Letby, the headline, Trust Me, I'm a Nurse. This is what the court heard during the second day of the trial. The Daily Mirror has a plea from James Bulger's mother to Prime Minister Liz Truss. Don't let James's killer walk free, she pleads, ahead of his parole hearing, as well as the legacy of Dame Angela Lansbury, right at the top there. And the star headlines, or features this headline rather, I love you to the moon and back, a not so successful space romance as a fake astronaut tricks a woman out of 27,000 pounds to rescue him from space. Is that all it would cost? <laughs> a reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you listen to our guests. So let's head to them then. Uh, Sonia and Mark are with us. Um, so let's catch up with the latest economic news, shall we? Uh, both the Financial Times and the Daily Telegraph leading on the decision by the Bank of England to stop this help effectively to pension funds, uh, Sonia. Um, and what that means both economically and politically. Take it away if you can. Well, I think it's quite worrying. So on the one hand, we've got the Bank of England launching another intervention today to buy gilts. Um, so that's an intervention to help save pension funds. But one thing that the governor of the Bank of England is really worried about is that it becomes sort of inbuilt in the system that whenever there are issues, the Bank of England will step in. It will bail pension funds out of some of these structural issues. And it's also trying to give a very strong signal that this help is not never ending. In fact, it's saying it's going to end by Friday. So pension funds have to sort of try and restructure to make themselves more sustainable in a very uncertain environment um, by Friday. So um, it's really difficult. And I think it comes, I mean, I'm sort of no uh, financial expert on this, um, but I think what it comes down to is the fact that um, you've got two different institutions pulling against each other. So you've got the government that is actually promising lots of tax cuts, which is quite expansionary, what the what economists call expansionary for the economy. Um, it expands demand. But at the same time, you've got the Bank of England trying to act to limit interest rates, which is, you know, tend to go up when demand goes up. That can have a terrible impact, for example, on people's mortgages. And so they're, they're coming in with a contractionary um, monetary policy. And so essentially, you've got two sets of institutions tugging against each other, doing opposite things. And this is one of the effects that's caused this issue for pension funds. So it doesn't feel very sustainable right now, I think, is, is, is one way of putting it. Yes, indeed. And uh, uh, Mr Bailey stressing that the programme was part of the Bank of England's financial stability operations, not part of its monetary policy, so therefore had to be temporary, um, saying to pension fund managers, you've got three days left now, you've got to get this done. While well, the industry body had urged the, B the Bank of England to extend it to October the 31st and even beyond. Anyway, where does this leave Liz Truss and the Chancellor politically then, Mark? Well, uh, the first thing you can say is it, it leaves the government in an extremely difficult position because, of course, one of the kind of um, prime laws of British politics since the 1990s is that the Bank of England is independent. The government, I fully expect, obviously will be asked to comment on uh, the governor's latest uh, comments and his decision and so on. And the government will say what every government does, which is that the Bank of England is independent and they don't meddle with how it 
does things, um, that doesn't make the issue go away. And it doesn't change the fact that um, when there's economic uh, turbulence and economic bad news, for obvious reasons, people look to the government um, uh, and, and, and allocate responsibility at their doorstep. That basically is an unsquareable circle for, for, for politicians, I think, in, the, in that particular instance. And to, just to add to what Sonia just said, I, you know, she, she's right about these kind of competing tensions between the kind of policy impacts of the government and the bank. That is a um, kind of more immediate contributory you know, trigger for where, why we are where we are. And it's, it's certainly going to continue to make this situation difficult. But what, what we're also seeing is this is the outcome of a very long term series of issues that have been developing for the best part of two decades. You know, we've had it, it's been clear for a very long time that the effects of artificially cheap money, uh, the artificially cheap credit, printing vast amounts of money, you know, even, even before COVID, um, for years and years on end, was storing up major kind of issues um, in a variety of core markets. And at some point, those were going to unwind. It's not, not, not just the case in this country, it's in the case of other countries as, uh, as well, to varying degrees. At some point, those were going to unwind. And it would be a mistake to assume that you could kind of defy gravity and levitate your way out of these things forever. The issue, of course, is that now what we're seeing is these things unwinding precipitously and fast and hard and painfully. Um, well, well, but I mean, I suppose the, the, issue is, the, the issue is for many people is that the Bank of England will spend so much time trying to tackle whatever the government's doing in its policy terms that it will distract from what its core aim right now has to be for all of us, which is to reduce inflation. And that, I think that's, you know, what partly shook the markets, isn't it, Mark? Sorry. Go on, Mark, you just sorry. finish off because I interrupted you. Sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I, you know, that, 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 that's part of the fact that you know, they've, they've got competing tasks to do. You know, financial stability includes stability in, the, in, in the, the pension markets, for example. It's interesting. One of the reasons I suspect the bank feels so strongly about this, and giving this kind of stark, you've got three days to deal with it, warning is they did warn the pension industry four years ago on, on, on this topic. But the problem they had is people looked at that warning and thought, interest rates aren't going to go back to what they uh, once, uh, well, what was once normal. That's not coming back. They didn't believe them. And, uh, and, and so now they have three days to unwind what was uh, meant to be unwound in four years. The question then is going to be, do they look at the bank and think, are you serious? You're playing chicken with us? Are you, if we don't unwind this by Friday, are you actually going to let us uh, get into worse trouble next week? Or is the bank going to go back on its word and, and step in again? And that, okay. at, at, at that point, that, you know, blows away another tool at the, the governor's disposal. Well, the Daily Telegraph um, suggests there are fears of more chaos to come, uh, suggesting that Ms Truss was challenged at Cabinet over plans to cut benefits in real terms, with four ministers understood to support an inflation-linked rise. Uh, Liz Truss, the paper says, has vowed to meet MPs to discuss their concerns. This is what Wednesday's all about, isn't it? PMQs in the tea rooms, presumably. In the meantime, two newspapers are talking about another U-turn, um, The Guardian and The Eye. So let's take a look at The Guardian, first of all. Um, renewable power companies will have revenues capped in England and Wales after the government bowed to pressure to curb runaway profits. Renewable power companies. Um, Sonia. So, yeah, absolutely. So Labour are claiming this as a win um, because one of the things they've been arguing is that the war in Ukraine has pushed energy prices up massively everywhere, which has basically delivered a huge windfall benefit to North Sea oil producers, to renewable producers of energy as well. And so one of the things that Labour has been arguing is that Rishi Sunak's windfall tax, there were lots of exemptions, um, lots of tax deductibles in that tax that essentially meant it raised a fairly limited amount. So Labour have been arguing you need to raise more by upping that tax and removing some of the exemptions for energy producers. Now, it sounds like what the government is going, is planning on doing, it is a huge U-turn. It's a big market intervention. Um, the suggestion seems to be that there will be a cap going forwards on the revenues of um, energy producers in the UK. So that would, for example, include North Sea Oil and Renewables. Now, it might be a slightly different mechanism to um, the windfall tax that Labour was talking about. But at the end of the day, it's still a huge market intervention along the same principles that Labour was arguing for. So that's, I think, why Labour is claiming it as a victory and also another very significant U 
U-turn because Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng said they weren't going to do this. They announced a package of energy interventions in the in the so-called mini budget three weeks ago, and they promised a huge program of tax cuts, um, unfunded tax cuts. That the Institute for Fiscal Studies has come out and said today would require sixty billion pounds worth of spending cuts to make the the, the books add up. But they weren't going to come in and take extra intervention on the energy industry, and it now looks like they are you turning from that. And the I says that uh, the business secretary, Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, will cut this move, will cut bills because soaring wholesale gas prices will no longer dictate electricity prices, bringing the UK into line with much of the EU, which is, you know, this anomaly we've had, isn't it, about what sets the price of electricity effectively, Mark. But do you, do you see this as a, a U-turn and a Labour win, as Sonia does? Well, it undoubtedly is a U-turn. Um, Labour obviously are going to claim claim that as a victory, and understandably so. I think that that, that in itself makes you know presents some minor, more minor challenges for Labour. The fact is that if this doesn't have the full desired effect, um, do they then say, well, we would have done it a little bit differently, or what? We'll have to wait and see. Um, this is part of the difficulty. And we were dealing a couple of weeks ago. We were all talking about purely a, what what felt like simply an economic confidence crisis or market confidence crisis. As soon as you U-turn, you as happened on 45p, you create a political and, and, and particularly Commons arithmetic confidence crisis. The question of uh, whether an MP will go out and stick their necks out and stand by the government. Some MPs I was talking to before the Tory conference were unusually, and not their normal mode, privately supportive, but keeping Sturm in public because they wanted to see if the new boss was like the old boss, where they got used to Boris making them look silly by sticking their necks out to back him up, and then he'd pull the rug from under them at the last minute. That uh, there's a risk that that becomes a spiral for the government. In that, uh, you know, next time fewer MPs are willing to take the risk of backing you because they think you might be a, you might be about to U-turn again. So it gets harder to hold your line again. A U-turn becomes more likely. So just very in, in a word, word, one word answer. Should there have been no U-turns um, in order to maintain um, executive um, authority? Uh, I, 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 a one-word answer would be no. Uh, slightly, slightly, slightly longer answer. You know, I, I simply think their their position became one where their arithmetic didn't add up, so they had to. Okay, practicalities there, I suppose. Um, stay there. Lots more still to come, uh, including the Metro, uh, which covers the chilling trial of uh, alleged baby killer Lucy Lemon. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me once again, the chief leader writer of The Observer, Sonia Soda, and the chief executive of Conservative Home, Mark Wallace. Welcome back to both of you. Um, so let's talk about Ukraine and Russia, in fact, um, and indeed how Middle Eastern countries are dealing with this. Um, front page picture of the uh, FT, Mark, um, a visit uh, to uh, Russia by the UAE. Um, this is interesting, isn't it? Because they helped broker, along with Saudi Arabia, and Turkey a prisoner exchange last month but the Americans are, are obviously watching this closely to see international alignments and who backs who uh, in the war. Yes it's quite a, a shocking image I think really when you think about recent months the fact that at long last the word pariah status has started to seem like it has some meaning when applied to Vladimir Putin and Russia after so long of people indulging a variety of vile and violent uh, acts on by, uh, carried out around the world by the Kremlin. To actually see the president of the UAE there in St. Petersburg shaking hands with Russia's dictator in the middle of this war is, is quite stark. And I think it, it really underscores the fact that the age of kind of moral relative, relativism of kind of um, you know there are they, they may be a baddie but there are baddie uh, to, to have a broadcast friendly paraphrase of a, a Cold War quote about dictators has has to be over you know we need to start insisting in the West that there are tough questions that people like say the UAE there's another story um, on the front page of the Guardian um, with the, the, uh, America's frustration at Saudi. Um, acting on uh, OPEC uh, policy in a way that helps, that seem to help Russia as well. Um, 
these countries cannot have it both ways. They need to start deciding whether they wish to proclaim themselves to be uh, allies and aligned with the Western world, or whether they wish to be uh, to flock together as birds of a feather with other despots. And you know, it's long been clear we shouldn't be reliant on uh, dictatorships of any sort for our energy. Vladimir Putin's actions have underscored that with gas from Russia. It's also true very starkly, of, uh, of oil from a variety of other tyrannies. Yeah, just one minute left. I mean, we remember post 9-11, don't we, Sonia? The axis of evil, are you with us or against us? Slight sense of that too. Um, and asked tonight if Saudi Arabia is aligning with Russia on Ukraine, um, a White House spokesperson said, we believe on that OPEC, OPEC plus decision that they are aligning with Russia. And this Guardian article, article suggesting that the Biden administration is considering tough new measures against Saudi Arabia. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my thoughts on it are maybe it shouldn't have taken it to get to this stage to uh, take this approach to Saudi Arabia. There were also huge questions about Saudi Arabia's um, human rights record, for example, domestically against um, journalists, for example, Jamal um, uh, Khashoggi, um, for example, what happened to him. So I do think that... Um, uh, Absolutely, we need to sort of um, consider that now. But there's been a lot of red flags about a country like Saudi Arabia, as Mark's just said, in the run up to this. And I think you've got to think about the strategic alliances that you make and whether they're right on a principled basis, not just on a sort of, you know, is this going to work for me in the next five to 10 years sort of basis. Mm. And uh, a final um, look at one of the newspapers. This was uh, late. Uh, news. Um, the sad news that Dame Angela Lansbury Mark has died as well at the age of 96, just a few days short of her 97th birthday. Yes, I'm sure a lot of people will have different favourite roles. For me, she'll always be Miss Eglantine Price from Bedknobs and Broomsticks, um, a film I recently watched with my kids and they loved it just as much as previous generations did. Mark, Sonia, lovely to have you both on. Thank you both very much indeed.